Good morning. I, uh, I welcome you to the house of the Lord as we uh, prepare to be ministered unto by the Lord's Spirit. And I recognize that we have all come here because the Lord's Spirit has called us to try to be those servants that he desires that indeed his love might go forth into all the world. We each have those um, properties of humanity that the Lord has given to us. And in our humanity, there is a part of the Lord with us. So that is why we are able to hear his call. For a uh, call to worship here, I want to read out of John 5th chapter, the 24th to the 30th verse. That's John 5th chapter. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he who heareth my word and believeth on him who sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they who hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all who are in their graves <clears throat> shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they who have done good in the resurrection of the just, and they who have done evil in the resurrection of the unjust, and shall all be judged of the Son of Man. For as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Let us turn to hymn number 205. 205.
Father, indeed we come before you hungering and thirsting after that lo word of love that brings life into all of mankind. We recognize that we gather together that indeed we might gain strength to withstand the wiles of the adversary. We know that uh, in this day and time there is much to fear, yet there is much to uh, look forward to, that we indeed can be able to see the fulfillment of prophecy in this day. But just touch our hearts that though indeed we might be more able to be receptive of that spirit that causes us to have that love permeate our being. We do pray for our speaker this hour that indeed he might have that uh, extra willingness to have his tongue loosed. But open our ears that we might hear what we should hear. We pray in the name of your loving son, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>
In uh, preparation for our brother's sermon, uh, let's uh, remain seated and sing 150, hymn 150, O God, our help in ages past. And of course, as always, when uh, someone is offered to bring the word of the Lord into our homes and our church, just into our lives we do pray for his for our attention to him for our brother Jonathan has uh, answering the call that the Lord has given him so him 150 morning. Today I'm drawing largely from the book of Mosiah chapter 11. If you want to follow along. This is the story of a group of people who had just escaped uh, the armies trying to attack them from a wicked king. It says, Now Alma, having been warned of the Lord that the armies of King Noah would come upon them and had made it known to his people, therefore they gathered together their flocks and took of their grain and departed into the wilderness before the armies of the king Noah. And the Lord did strengthen them that the people of King Noah could not overtake them to destroy them. And they fled eight days' journey into the wilderness, and they came to a land, yea, even a very beautiful and pleasant land, a land of pure water. And they pitched their tents and began to till the ground and began to build buildings. Yea, they were industrious and did labor exceedingly. And the people were desirous that Alma should be their king, for he was beloved by his people. But he said unto them, Behold, it is not expedient that we should have a king, for thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not esteem one flesh above another, or one man shall not think himself above another. Therefore I say unto you, It is not expedient that ye should have a king. Nevertheless, if it were possible that ye could always have just men to be your kings, it would be well for you to have a king. 
But remember the iniquity of King Noah and his priests. And I myself was caught in a snare and did many things which were abominable in the sight of the Lord, which caused me sore repentance. Nevertheless, after much tribulation, the Lord did hear my cries and did answer my prayers and has made me an instrument in his hands in bringing so many of you to a knowledge of his truth. Nevertheless, in this I do not glory, for I am unworthy to glory of myself. And now I say unto you, ye have been oppressed by King Noah, and have been in bondage to him and his priests, and have been brought into iniquity by them. Therefore ye were bound with the bands of iniquity. And now as ye have been delivered by the power of God out of these bonds, yea, even out of the hands of King Noah and his people, and also from the bonds of iniquity, even so, I desire that ye should stand fast in this liberty wherewith ye have been made free, and that ye trust no man to be a king over you, and also trusting no one to be your teacher nor your minister, except he be a man of God walking in his ways and keeping his commandments. Thus did Alma teach his people that every man should love his neighbor as himself, that there should be no contention among them. And now Alma was their high priest, he being the founder of their church. And it came to pass that none received authority to preach or to teach, except it were by him from God. Therefore he consecrated all their priests and all their teachers, and none were consecrated, except they were just men. Therefore they did watch over their people and did nourish them with things pertaining to righteousness. And it came to pass that they began to prosper exceedingly in the land, and they called the land Helam. And it came to pass that they did multiply and prosper exceeding in the land of Helam, and they built a city, which they called the city of Helam. Nevertheless, the Lord seeth fit to chasten his people. Yea, he trieth their patience and their faith. Nevertheless, whosoever putteth his trust in him, the same shall be lifted up at the last day. Yea, and thus it was with this people. For behold, I will show unto you that they were brought into bondage, and none could deliver them but the Lord their God, yea, even the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. It goes on to tell how the army of the Lamanites came upon them. Does this story remind you at all of, of church history? I remember hearing about the saints showing up here in Missouri and they were not treated well. But one of the things that stands out that I remember is when they showed up, you have to remember they, they didn't have motor vehicles. They did not have paved roads. They showed up with what they were able to bring with them. And within a remarkably brief period of time, everywhere they showed up, there was suddenly a, a, a grain mill. They could grind grain. There was a lumber mill. Everywhere they showed up, just all of a sudden, these civilization developments happened. And Missouri was not unoccupied at the time. It was, it was at the frontier, but there, how many years had people been here? And the saints showed up, and all of a sudden, all this, all this began to happen. And they were, they were blessed. And you imagine the, the built-in prosperity to getting things done. Suddenly you're taking care of business. You suddenly have a lumber mill, you can grind grain, all this stuff. There, there wasn't, they weren't competing with somebody that was already here. They, they introduced this. And it would have been natural for them to prosper, but they faced persecutions. Persecutions. 
Now the Lord seeth fit to chasten his people. I made sure to look up that word because when you hear it in context, you have this mental picture and, and you can just slide by, feel like, oh, okay, I, I, I know what they're saying. But I looked it up in the 1828 dictionary and I think this meaning is very significant that he used that word to correct by punishment, to inflict pain for the purpose of reclaiming an offender as to chasten a son with a rod. And back then, they used scripture verses to be an example of the use of 2 Samuel 7, I will chasten him with the rod of men. Or the second part of the definition, to afflict by other means. The reference is from Re Revelations 3, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Or the third part, to purify from errors or faults. What if something came upon us as a people where we were driven out from our land? We just had to grab what we could and leave to escape something bad that was going to happen to us. And we go out into the woods, and all we have is some food, some animals, some tents. But short, shortly after that, we're building buildings and then after that, we have an actual city. How would we view ourselves? I think we might take a moment and go, we did pretty good. We, we got shoved out into the wilderness with hardly anything with us, and now we've got an actual city. And it doesn't say this, but I picture them stopping and saying, you know, we did pretty good. And they accomplished a lot. And that was the Lord blessing them. But the Lord looked at this and said, you're not all the way where I want you. And this happened to the saints. And I can't suppose that any of us are somehow better we're, we're the exact same humans with the same need for salvation the same need for God to work in our lives to intervene we're, we're in that, that same situation Lord looks at us and says you have not gotten all the way there says he tries their patience and their faith He said, and thus it was with this people. Now they were again subjected to an army that was an enemy of theirs that was going to destroy them. And they were afraid and Alma went and stood forth among them and exhorted them that, that they should not be frightened but that they should remember the Lord their God and he would deliver them. So they had strong spiritual leadership even in the midst of, of this, this evil, this harm coming to them. And they began to cry unto the Lord that he would soften the hearts of the Lamanites, that they would spare them and their wives and their children. And it came to pass that the Lord did soften the hearts of the Lamanites. And Alma and his brethren went forth and delivered themselves up into their hands, and the Lamanites took possession of the land of Helam. So isn't that a strange thing to go through? They, they showed up to this land, nobody else was there, and they settled there, and they built their city, and somebody else came up, showed up, 
hey, we're, we're taking this. Strangely enough, the armies of the Lamanites had been following somebody and they got lost. They, they were actually lost in the wilderness when they did this. Said, hey, these guys have something good, let's take it. Now they had good leadership, good spiritual leadership, not just good worldly leadership. Now what direction do you look for what is good, what is good advice? It's easy to say, you look to God. You look to Jesus. You look to the Holy Spirit. Now when Jesus was walking this earth, the prophecies about him said, with no apparent beauty that man should him desire, that the, the, the truth about who he was was concealed. Be, if he showed up fully revealing who he was, would anybody have had a choice as to whether or not to follow him? You, anybody who saw him would be unable to choose otherwise. They would have to fall to their knees and acknowledge him. And he kept that concealed so that they could choose. Not ba how, much, how much do we choose in this life based on an outward appearance? He kept that hidden. And I think about any of the, the, the movies or the, the ways that people depict Jesus. And I think you, you don't want to disrespect him, but you need to make sure that you don't choose an actor that looks like, well, of course everybody's going to follow him. He looks great. He's charismatic, you know, and j just whatever you know, the world would look to. He kept that hidden so that we could make that choice. But there were witnesses to who he was. Remember John the Baptist. When he baptized Jesus, and the Spirit came down and bore witness of Jesus, and the Father, our Father in heaven, spoke and said, this is my beloved Son. And to use modern terms, you listen to him. And we're told in the scriptures that the Father bears witness of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we saw that, that Jesus bore witness of the Father and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit. Jesus told the disciples, I'm going to go so that you will have the witness of the Holy Spirit to be present with you, which bears witness of him and the Father. And that's where we're at now. And we live in a world that is very cunning and deceiving. And you have to have a very firm grasp on your faith. The things that people come up with, I, I won't mention them, but it's, it's sometimes astonishing what people will come up with desperate to find any way to not be answerable to an almighty God. And those same, same people don't like to see others clinging to that faith. It makes them uncomfortable because it's a witness against them. And you look at the prayers over the sacrament. They're usually printed in the front of the hymnal. You might take a look and see what it has to say about having his spirit to always be with us. Now we are small in number, but we need to be a people that always have the Lord's spirit leading us and guiding us to bear witness of the Father and the Son.
when I looked at the children that came up here this morning, of course, you start hoping for a second, oh boy, don't make a bunch of noise and don't cause trouble. But the other thing that also comes to mind is what Jesus had to say about them. Allow those little children to come to me because these are the kind of people that the kingdom of God is made up of. Now, he had been saying that to his disciples. They, they understood the principle, and that's why they had started off by saying, oh, no, don't, don't bother him with your kids. They're good. They don't, they don't, they basically were, it looked like they were saying, these guys don't really need further ministry. They're set. You know, they're still young and innocent. It's, just leave them alone. And Jesus said, no, no, let them, let them come to me. These are the kind of people that the, the kingdom of God is made up of. They're still innocent. They don't have, have things like malice. And all the things that have gone wrong with this world is, has not sprung up in their hearts yet. And when he tells us repeatedly, you need to become as a little child. He doesn't say become foolish or naive or unwise in some way. He says, give up the things that went wrong in your heart and your mind that make you not like a child. Are there capacity to trust implicitly when you tell them something? Their capacity to just believe it. That's okay. That's how it is. Their ability to be free of malice, which I think is one of the huge, huge things wrong with this world. In preparing for this sermon, I contemplated doing something. Uh, I contemplated grabbing a bunch of uh, duffel bags and uh, large sacks that hold kind of a high volume and I thought about labeling them I was going to put one marked sin another one vanity and pride another one malice another one self indulgence all these different things and see if I could get them all picked up it would be a lot of trouble probably a big distraction but, but if you picture that how often do we cling, you hear the term, you know, your favorite sin, the one that you don't, well, I'll leave that one for, for last. Jesus told us, lay your burdens down. Those, those things I just described, those are the burdens that he wants us to lay down. He doesn't want to lay down good things. He said, my, my burden is, is light. You carry Jesus with you, he's not a heavy burden. He doesn't make your life more, he doesn't make it difficult. The world will make your, your life difficult because of it. This world hates God, and this world hates Jesus, and it's becoming more and more apparent. When when God said, I want you to pay your tithing, and you stepped out in faith, he didn't make life more difficult. He didn't leave you going, I kind of wish I'd have kept that. He, he provided you instantly. And he does that for all of us. The Lord was working in the lives of these uh, Nephites that went into the wilderness and as much reason as they had to believe hey we're, we're doing great he wanted them closer to him and he put them through something difficult to bring them there now he didn't do this going well I hope they make it when he did this he said, these guys are going to make the right choice. What I do here is going to work 
It is going to bring them closer to me. They will respond in faith. I will be able to do a great work in their lives that will bring them joy. I will bring good things to them. Now, Alma directly equated escaping iniquity with escaping a tyrant king. They were hand in hand. They went together at the same time. You escaped the sin you were under because this guy led you wrong, and you also escaped the wrong that he was imposing on you. And so I, I see the need in my own life, that of the saints, that we have so much farther to go. The Lord wants us closer to him. In 1984, that was, that was when I turned eight. I was baptized right after a lot of things went down. And I still remember going to Book of Mormon days and, and uh, some of the, the large-scale meetings you could have in the auditorium. And even though I was a, just a child at that time, I, I miss it. And when I hear older adults who completely grew up with the RLDS church, and they say, man, you know, if we could just go back to this one year because everything was going great, I understand. However, we didn't have Zion yet. And if you look back, even though things were going great at that point in time, somewhere, somehow, we were still on a track to end up where we went. And the Lord wants us to become Zion. He desires of us to become a people that when he looks at us, he says, you are a people who live together in righteousness. You are a people who have no poor among you because you have prospered under my blessings and you've taken care of each other. And what kind of laws will we have to follow to do that? The laws of men don't make that happen. They never have and they never will. There, there is no theory, no law, no approach that the world has that can get us where we need to be. They've tried it all. There's people now trying to claim, well, we just need communism. It, it never was implemented correctly. Well, it's had way too many chances but there's no other ism that gets us to Zion the world doesn't have it the world does not have the answer God has the answer God is the answer and he sent us Jesus Christ to be the life and the way and the truth and he told us, no man comes to the Father except by me. When you hear something from this world that claims to be, well, I've got this special understanding of God, so you need to listen to me. But it bears no witness of Jesus, no witness of the Holy Spirit, or attempts to re-identify them as somebody else then you know that that's not where you need to look. The scriptures are consistent. The scriptures have no internal argument as to what the truth is. It's consistent. God does not change. He is the same from yesterday to today and forever. He does not change. And we need to take a moment and and think what a wonderful thing it is that this self-existing God who lasts forever happens to be loving and kind and merciful? What would it be like if the guy who exists forever and has no end and is all-powerful were mean? 
there's people who try to, oh, God's mean. He does this. He, you know, he did that. He allowed this to happen. There's people who try to say that. But what if, what if these people had responded that way? Well, you know, where's God if these Lamanites are showing up? How come this happened to us? No, their response, they eventually got set free. God delivered them. They kept a hold of their faith. They, they were true to it. They did not give up. They did not let go. Now, if the Lord wanted them to be subject to improvement, to, as the definition says, to purify from errors or faults, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. How much more do we, we, have, we haven't accomplished what they did. We seek to build the city of Zion. We have, we've, not, we've not built a city. We haven't gotten as far as they did. It, it, from my perspective, I, I think they were an amazing, amazingly productive people to just go out into the wilderness and and shortly after have buildings in a city. That's, that's amazing. And the Lord said, yeah, on your scale, on your scale, that's amazing. On my scale, it's you, I have so much more for you, so much more, so much more beyond that. And we think about how precious these scriptures are and how dear they are and how, okay, we go, how much we need to study them. And the Lord says, that's, that's one bar. These are not even all the records in the bar I want from you. This, this, this should be a, a given that you know these. The bar I want from you is to have such a relationship with me that you hear these words straight from me. Remember when somebody went complaining to Moses, 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 you're our leader, you're the prophet, and this guy over here, you know, you need to, you need to stop him, he's prophesying. And the, Moses said, oh, I wish that all of you would hear from the Lord. He wanted, every, he, he didn't want to be the only one who heard from God. God did not want him to be the only one. Do you remember the instance where the Lord told the people, okay, here's, here's some preparations I want you to do. Here's some things to do. Here's some things to not do. We're going to get together. I want you to come and see me the way Moses did. People said, uh, Moses was scary enough when he came back. We couldn't even look at him. I'd, I don't think we can, we can do this. And they made a choice. They made a choice. All these things. The people's response in the book of Mosiah to having the Lamanites come upon them, they made a choice. Alma influenced that choice by reminding them, don't be afraid, trust in God. They made a choice. I recently heard it said that when you're married to somebody, there, were, there was a man... Uh, who was about to get married, and in a in a conversation, he he said, you know, you know, what if what if he was he was worried about getting married? He said, well, what if I marry you, and then I meet somebody who's better? And his wife said, it's going to happen. You will there will always be somebody who's younger and prettier and this and that. No, it guys that marry a famous supermodel, there's there's always somebody else. You make a choice, and the choice is every day, say, in a marriage relationship, you choose that person every day. It, people want to know, oh, how do you make a marriage last? You, you choose that person. Of course there's options, and the problem is, is if you think of other people as options. That's a problem. You either made a commitment or you didn't. And if you go, oh, well, maybe this person's an option, you didn't really make a commitment. 
If you think there's an option other than choosing God and what he has to say, where's your commitment to him? If you think that's an option. If your response is, though he slay me, yet will I praise him. That's, that's commitment. If, you're, if your choice is, even if the world comes against me and demands that I deny Jesus and I know for a moral certainty that they will not hesitate to take everything from me, everything I have, all the people in my life and my own life, and that has happened. That has happened to people. And how many people have said, I, I cannot, I cannot deny him. I am unable because I know that he is real. I know he is true. I know who he is. And I cannot turn against him. I have largely used up the time that I have to speak, but the time to move forward and continue on the path of always, always choosing, choosing God before everything else in the face of a world that seeks to demand that we do otherwise, that is always in front of us. And I hope I hope that I get to see a body of people that I know God looked down on them and said, you are Zion. I hope that I can be part of that. I hope that everyone here will be part of that. Some of the, some of the things that I see people doing in an effort to serve God, I hope to see that bear fruit that just like the elders from the 1800s who went to the land of Israel, a desolate, barren, uninhabited desert, they picked the spot, they knelt down and prayed and said, Lord, we dedicate this to the restoration of Israel. And I, I don't know the exact number of years, but it was a couple of generations later on, the people instrumental in declaring Israel to be a nation picked that spot not not even like okay here off to the side they went to the actual spot the location on the land where those men knelt down and prayed to God and said we declare Israel a nation and if he can bear fruit they they never got to see it happen. But they did it in faith anyways. And so I say, even if it never works out that I get to see Zion in person and be part of it, in the same way those guys planted that seed, I still hope that whatever I do on behalf of Zion will carry forward, that the ripples will reach, and that it will mean something that will mean something years down the road, that it will not be an empty effort. I have that hope. And all the people that said, well, you know, I don't think it'll happen. I guess it's your generation's turn. No, you need to have the hope that what you did, your work in this life, bears fruit in the future. The same reason why you try to teach your children good things, why, do you, why you teach them about God, why you teach them about Jesus, you... you you teach them the scriptures because it will bear fruit. So let us go from here and always choose God and stand in the hope that what we do will bear fruit for his kingdom.
You know, we have to always remember that in the Book of Mormon, it says that there must be opposition in all things. But if we can remember the words of our brother here today, we can keep the scales weighted to the good. Let us turn in our hymnals to 203. 203. Let's walk in the light. In all creation, we thank thee for this hour, this worship, this day that we would praise, honor, and glorify thee as the one true God. And, O oh Lord, thank you for the words of wisdom which has been spoken by our brother today, delivered from on high through your written and received word. And may we internalize that word. And may we live by that word and walk in the light, in your light, O oh God. So I ask that you bless each household here and each household who has joined us. That, Father, this, this day and our lives would honor and glorify thee, walking hand in hand with your Son, Jesus Christ, and your Holy Spirit. I pray and ask. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whom we trust, amen.
Kathy. Just, just say. Uh, next Sunday evening, we're going to be hosting the first.